right, Jessica, are you ready if we get started? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our very first HMSC virtual Thursday research seminar. Um, be a little patient with us if technology glitches, but I think we are good to go. Um, my name is Cinnamon. I'm your uh, the research program manager at the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for this event. Um, and we have just a couple of logistics to talk about, um, and then I'll have a few announcements, and then I'll hand it off to today's presenter. Um, just want to let everybody know that your mics should be muted um, and your cameras should remain off. Um, and if you would like to communicate with us, um, you can do so in the chat box um, down below. Uh, put in any questions at any time and we will answer them at the end of today's presentation. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know that this presentation is being recorded currently um, and we will post it to our past seminars page hopefully in a few days. So if you know anybody that is unable to attend today, you can let them know they can watch the seminar there. Um, uh, a few announcements. I just wanted to promote that next week we are also doing a virtual science on tap on Thursday night with Taylor Chapel. Um, he is going to speak to us about um, his shark research. So we're excited about that. Um, so please join us uh, for a virtual science on tap. And then next week we'll be doing um, a seminar with Gordon Kirst, who is going to talk to us about integrated ecosystems assessment and the Gulf of Alaska, um, and that will be on May 21st. So um, we're excited to get this uh, virtual seminar rolling. So um, just want to introduce today's speaker. Um, Jessica Gursky is um, our presenter today. Did I do okay, Jessica? <laughs> All right. Um, she did her master's in Germany at Kiel University in zoology and biology and oceanography studying the feeding ecology of tropical seabirds around Christmas Island in Australia. Her PhD um, was with the plankton ecology group at GMAR, um, also in Kiel, focusing on the warming and acidification effects of marine plankton communities. She also did some work at the University of British Columbia on how warming modifies trophic interactions on freshwater plankton communities. After finishing her PhD, she started her first postdoc um, working with the Bioacid Project, um, diving deeper into the effects of ocean acidification. And in 2017, Jessica started her current postdoc position in the um, uh, Pelagic Ecosystems Lab at the University of British Columbia, um, where she's studying how food quality affects salmon fitness. Jessica was invited to speak with us today by Jessica Miller. And you can't hear it, but the HMSC community is giving you a warm welcome. Um, and I'm gonna uh, go ahead and mute my mic and log off and hand it off to you. So welcome, Jessica. Yeah, hello everyone. Nice to um, not see you, but be, being able to talk to you. Uh, I just want to give you a heads up. I shared a link in the chat box for a small activity I included into this. So if you could prepare just um, opening the web page and then start and help me with this activity before um, I actually start with this talk. So um, today's talk is about um, how regional changes and also temporal changes affect juvenile sockeye salmon condition. And um, I did my study um, just to show you an overview where you are, I marked in red the um, Oregon, like the, the uh, marine station where you are, and also where Vancouver is and the area here where I, where I studied the juvenile salmon. Um, so salmon is a very important uh, part of um, British Columbia, especially has a very traditional uh, rooting in the First Nations. They have a very deep spiritual relationship with salmon. And also some First Nation communities are founded on traditional fishing grounds. And many treaties revolve 
on fishing quotas for the British Columbian First Nation communities. But also salmon has a very important ecological role in the ecosystems here. They pre they, uh, sockeye salmon and other salmon are very important uh, food source for top predators, but also with the migration up the rivers for when they go back for the reproduction, they transport nutrients up the rivers, but also uh, salmon recreational fishery has a very important economical uh, value in British Columbia. Like, um, on, like an annual output in British Columbia on recreational salmon fishery has a value of 713 Canadian dollars. When we, when we compare this to, um, to Oregon, Oregon has a fishing uh, value of 285 million dollars. But also they have a, um, the commercial salmon fishery in British Columbia has, um, is very important annually. They uh, make uh, on average um, $324 million and the rest of Canada only $180 million. When we compare this to Oregon again, it's just $90 million. But in the past, there were a lot of discussions and headlines around salmon fisheries, especially in British Columbia. And um, especially last year, the return numbers were lower than they actually predicted um, based on, on the numbers from the last years before. And so there's a big concern, what is actually going on with the salmon and why it, it, it's actually declining. One of the most important stocks in British Columbia is the Fraser River sockeye salmon. And um, this, uh, the Fraser uh, River sockeye salmon consists of 24 stocks. And these 24 stocks are distributed over 22 lakes and two rivers. And the Fraser River is one of the longest lakes in, in British Columbia. It goes all the way from central B British Columbia and then um, it goes into the Strait of Georgia um, at Vancouver. So the salmon declined in the past and when we, and the first big decline was actually observed between 2007 and 2009. And there were just um, a run number in Fraser River sockeye salmon of 1.5 million fish. Um, but Based on the headlines from last year and other years before, there were even lower numbers um, on returning of returned salmon. In 2015, only 2.1 million, 2016, 855,000. And in 2019, only 620,000 sockeye salmon of the Fraser River came back for the reproduction period. So based on this low return rate numbers on 2007 and, two, and 2009, there was a commission um, um, initiated back in 2010 to investigate what is actually happening with the salmon. And this commission, the Cohen Commission, um, uh, published um, like a big report on the sockeye salmon and other salmon in British Columbia and they gave out recommendations and one recommendation was to investigate where and when are significant mortalities and especially during the early marine migration along the coast of British Columbia. Why do they actually care about the early marine migration phase of, of, some, uh, of salmon? And when you look at the life cycle of, this, of salmon, salmon can spend up to three years in the rivers before they um, migrate down the rivers and go into the salt water. And then they spend one to five years in the ocean until they return back to, their, to the rivers. And when they um, migrate from the freshwater to the salt water, the studies show that they are actually very sensitive to during that change, during this multiplication process, but also when they just enter the, um, the, the, the coastline. 
when we look into, especially into the Fraser River, uh, sockeye salmon, you see here, this area is now in, in this bigger map. And here's the, the outflow of the Fraser River. And the salmon has actually, salmon has actually two ways to migrate out to the open ocean. One way they can, they can choose to take is to go through the Strait um, of Juan de Fuca and uh, into the Pacific Ocean. But also what is like really interesting is that most of the salmon goes northwards along all the coast from the Strait of Georgia into the Johnston Strait and then into Queen Charlotte Strait into the Gulf of Alaska. So uh, the higher majority takes the northern route to get into the open ocean. And when we zoom in further into, um, into this northern part of this route, we see in the northern Strait of Georgia here, there are actually different ways or uh, routes juvenile uh, salmon can take until they actually ha have to go into the Johnston Strait into the Queen Charlotte Strait. And the Cohen Commission found based on literature and tagging studies that there's a high mortality especially in this area and they recommended to investigate what is actually going on in this area. And now it's time for you to look into uh, onto the web page and give me some words and some ideas of yours why there's actually uh, what what could be the reasons for this high mortality in this area. I hope it works and so you submit some words and we will see this here. Okay, so you say, yeah, no, it's coming. Yeah, this looks like fun. <laughs> yeah, predation, lipids, quality, food. Yeah, food, very important for everyone. Yeah, yeah, habitat, predation. Yeah, it's all good good ideas and um, further, yeah, I want to dig into what the ideas actually was and predation is really good and food is really big. And um, so most of you actually say food is very important and others thought so too. And one hypothesis that was formulated by McKinnell et al in 2014 is the trophic gauntlet hypothesis. And they thought based on the uh, oceanography and the differences of the oceanography in this area that there might be a trophic gauntlet. And especially in the Strait of Georgia, they proposed that this is a high productive area because it's the temperature are a little bit warmer, lots of nutrients, a lot of chlorophyll in this area. So it's a high productive area and would represent a good foraging area for the juvenile salmon when they enter the northern Strait of Georgia. And the Johnston Strait would represent a low feeding opportunity because the temperature there of the water is 
it's colder, it's a high turbid environment, a lot of vertical mixing, light limitation for the phytoplankton, so a low amount of concentrations of chlorophyll A and less zooplankton, so a low feeding opportunity. And then in the Queen Charlotte Straits, the water gets a little bit warmer again, is less mixed and higher productive and can act as a recovery area. So when I looked into um, uh, some data, I, and I, comp I looked into juvenile salmon or sockeye salmon in these three areas, the Northern Strait of Georgia, Johnson Strait and Queen Charlotte Strait of the years 2015 and 2016. And blue represents 2015. What we see here is the length weight residuals and a positive uh, value represents that the juvenile salmon were um, heavier expected on or based on their length and the negative value shows that they are even lighter um, based on their length. So in 2015 we can see a high high length weight residuals when they entered the northern strait of Georgia and a decrease in their weight compared to their length over their migration north. But in 2016, the length weight residuals um, were constantly low. And the Johnson Strait as this um, trophic gauntlet shows that they, or we think that we can, that they were starving here. And this is why they lost the weight on their northward migration. But the length weight residuals or also Fulton K index is a very classical tool to look into the condition of, it, of fish. But I also looked in the uh, ratio of RNA to DNA. So what does this ratio tell us? So when we have a lot of RNA, RNA in the cell, um, we have a high metabolic activity, a higher transcription rate compared to the amount of DNA in the cell. So a higher amount, a higher ratio of RNA to DNA um, gives a good, shows that it's a healthy and metabolic active fish, fish so it's growing. A lower ratio sh sh shows that it's less metabolic active and in a, in a worse shape. And we see that the uh, trophic gauntlet area, the Johnson Strait, um, in the RNA-DNA ratio were a bad feeding or a bad area for the juvenile salmon. But then they were able to recover again in Queen, uh, Queen Charlotte Strait in 2015. But again, in 2016, the juvenile salmon entered the Northern Strait of Georgia in a bad condition, kept bad in this trophic gauntlet area, and then just increased slightly in the Queen Charlotte Strait. So we see that the condition is actually bad uh, in, for juvenile, of juvenile salmon in this Johnson Strait. Yeah, so there is potentially this trophic gauntlet in Johnson Strait. So we were asking why do juvenile salmon have this low condition in this trophic gauntlet or Johnson Strait? Can it be food biomass, what you already said? Can it be the species, prey species composition? Is it the food quality? And to, an and to answer this question, we have this juvenile salmon program, which started in 2015 and is running until this year. And uh, the working hypothesis is early the early marine phase is critical to, to salmon survival, what is actually proposed by the Cohen Commission back in 2012. And this program um, is based on an annual sampling in the Northern Salish Sea during the peak migration, which is usually from beginning of May to the beginning of July. And during that time, um, juvenile salmon is sam sampled in this in this whole area, Northern Strait of Georgia, Johnston Strait and Queen Charlotte Strait. So what we do during this juvenile salmon program, we go out with several field crews, head to the different sampling locations. We do surface spotting of the different, uh, of the salmon and then uh, collect the fish on, on the boat and process most of the fish there and um, bring them later back to, this, um, to, the, to the lab. 
So to look first into the food biomass, we had a student, a master student working on um, juvenile sockeye salmon uh, stomach contents and uh, gut fullness. So she uh, dissected juvenile sockeye salmon and then what you can see here is a dried sockeye stomach. And she looked into the fullness of the, sto of the stomachs. So based on literature data, we know the gut fullness index from the Northern Strait of Georgia, which was published by Price et al. in 2013. But Brodeur et al. showed gut fullness in, in this index data from, the, from Northern British Columbia. But everything in between, like the trophic gauntlet or the entrance to the trophic gauntlet and the Queen Charlotte Strait, were not really uh, investigated in the past. So what Sam found in her, in her master thesis is in the uh, northern strait of Georgia, the gut, gut fullness was pretty, uh, was pretty high or the, the guts were pretty full in the northern strait of Georgia when they entered the Discovery Islands and um, uh, Johnston Strait and then they declined. So there were less, the sockeye salmon stomachs were less full and then they entered Queen Charlotte Strait again here and got full again. So the, the sockeye salmon just started to feed again. So it seems, okay, there's actually, they are starving or they are not feeding at all in this trophic gauntlet. But to really look into this, are they starving or are they just not feeding because they just try to browse through this cold and uh, turbid area. So therefore, we looked into the zooplankton biomass in the three different areas and found a regional difference in the zooplankton biomass. So higher zooplankton biomass in the northern strait of Georgia, just a slight difference between the years 2015 and 16. A low biomass in the Johnson Strait and then it goes up again in Queen Charlotte Strait. But zooplankton biomass is not the only index you can look at when you think about zooplankton or prey availability. So therefore, I also looked at the zooplankton abundance, so the individuals we actually have. And there we see a completely different picture. We have low numbers in the Northern Strait of Georgia and Queen Charlotte Strait, and a high number in the Johnson Strait area. So this indicates that there is actually a change in the species composition or the size composition between the different areas where the sockeye salmon has to uh, swim through. And therefore I calculated the average zooplankton size and we see that there's actually smaller individuals in the Johnston Strait compared to the more southern northern strait of Georgia or the northeastern uh, Queen Charlotte Strait. So that's a good indication about the prey availability. Um, so at differences in this different region. But also what Sam looked at was the prey species composition. So not only measuring the gut fullness, but also she went through hundreds and hundreds of sockeye salmon stomachs and um, looked in the different species she found and she did a great job in just making uh, counting and identifying everything. So, and what she found in the prey species composition in the different areas was that in the Northern Strait of Georgia, what you can see uh, on the right side of the figure, is it's really diverse between both years. So there are over, in the Northern Strait of Georgia, there are amphipods, calanoid copepods, cladocians, decapods, and euphosids. But when you go or oh, into the Johnston Strait, we have mainly um, calanoid copper pots. They, um, what the, as a source of prey and what the Druminae salmons are, um, are feeding on. So, and also between years, there's just a slight different in the Northern Strait of Georgia. So it's highly diverse when they, uh, and a higher diversity in food and prey items for in the northern strait of Georgia and really small and um, and uh, not that diverse in the Johnson Strait. So this gives us a good indication and the 
the reason for this difference in the species composition and the biomass and the abundance is based on the uh, physical oceanography. In the 1970s, Thompson um, described the first time the physical oceanography of this area and said, okay, there are two different areas. We just have the Johnson Strait, like this northern part, and the southern part the no from the northern Strait of Georgia, and that they are different. But Haley Dosser described it mo in more depth and refined this theory. And what she found is that there is actually a strong vertical uh, front in the, uh, the um, at the beginning of the Johnston Strait. And there's just a slight exchange of water on the surface, like the, just the first two or three meters are exchanging between the different areas and the rest is separated from each other. So the Johnston Strait area and also Queen Charlotte Strait area has a very high, high salinity but also cold water, low temp uh, potential temperature. Compared to the Northern Strait of Georgia and the Discovery Islands, the temperature is slightly warmer and less salt, um, a lower salinity in this area. So two different, completely two different areas that are important for the difference in the zooplankton composition and biomass that can lead to this trophic gauntlet. But what I also did in the past is, or in, um, yeah, with the juvenile, uh, so, juvenile salmon, I looked at the quality of the fish and if food quality or of the quality of the fish is really different between the different areas. And for those who are not familiar with fatty acids, there are two big groups in the fatty acids. There's for one, the saturated fatty acids and the unsaturated fatty acids. And unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bound. And, and the unsaturated fatty acid can be distinguished between monounsaturated fatty acids, so they just have one double bound, and poorly unsaturated fatty acids, so they have more than one double bound. And Part of the polyunsaturated fatty acids are the essential fatty acids, which cannot be produced by an organism. They have to be taken up by the food. And also essential fatty acids are important for growth, for health, for the development of neural tissue, but they are also involved in uh, gene expression regulations. So I looked in the fatty acid composition of the juvenile sockeye salmon. And what you can see here is the total uh, of fatty acid composition based on the two years, 2015 and 16. And based on this clustering, you can see that the northern strait of Georgia in blue is, is separated from the Johnson Strait in yellow and Queen Charlotte Strait in gray. So there's a clear separation in the fatty acid composition. And um, okay, you can say, yeah, that's interesting. They are different, but actually you want to know what is actually different. Why are, or in which detail are they differing between the, the regions and the, and the years? So I looked into uh, different groups and I walk through you, walk all of you through these different groups. First of all, I looked at the total fatty acid concentration in the, in the fish. And what I found is that in the Northern Strait of Georgia in 2015, again blue, they had a, how, how, a higher amount of total fatty acid and it declined again with this trophic gauntlet. And they were compared in 2015, they were actually pretty low compared to the 2015 fish. And interestingly, this picture that it's higher in the Northern Strait of Georgia in 2015 and declines and just this slight change in 2016 fatty acid can be seen in different groups, not only the total fatty acid concentrations, but also in the amount of saturated fatty acids. It's the same picture. And also when you look at the monounsaturated fatty acids and the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And when you think about, okay, yeah, this kind of makes sense. So when you think about, okay, the fish, the juvenile salmon are starving in the Johnston Strait in this trophic gauntlet, they actually have to mobilize en energy from fatty acids in form of ATP. And fit what fish 
or what's the easiest way to mobilize this stored energy from fatty acids is first of all use saturated fatty acids and then the next step would be to use monounsaturated fatty acid and the last step would be using polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we see this picture in the groups I presented before in the total amount saturated, monounsaturated, they were used in 2015 when they entered the trophic gauntlet um, area. So, but when you look into this ratio, these are two essential fatty acids, DHA and EPA. And this is a classical ratio, especially um, using, used in aquaculture and fisheries, giving an indication of quality. Um, so a higher DHA EPA amount says, yeah, it's a, um, this is a good quality and a lower amount of DHA to EPA ratio, it's a, a less, lower uh, quality um, of the fish or the food. So, and when we see this here, we see actually that in 2016, the fish arrived in a, um, with a higher ratio, and then it declined with the Johnson Strait. But the fish in 2016 were able, in 2015, were able to keep the DHA EPA, EPA ratio up in the Johnson Strait, and then it declined later in, in Queen Charlotte Strait. To make it easier to, um, to compare it, what we saw before, it's like the RNA DNA ratio here, we see this decline, and then it goes up again in 2015. We see this picture, like in, for example, total fatty acids, say, okay, this does not really make sense why the RNA DNA ratio goes up again. And also in 2016, it was not that bad in, the, in Johnson Strait in the trophic gauntlet. So what, how can we explain the RNA DNA ratio? And this is what we can actually see in the DHA to EPA ratio here. We have this higher quality in the fish in 2015 uh, 2015, which enables this higher RNA DNA ratio in Queen Charlotte Strait later and a better recovery. And this also shows that you cannot only look at one specific fatty acid group to, to look for reasons what's going on. You also have to look into ratios and single fatty acids, not only bigger groups. So what we see here, what's affecting the juvenile salmon is also based on the essential fatty acids that are produced at the base of the food web in at the phytoplankton area uh, level. And then it's, tr it's transported further up by trophic interactions to the zooplankton, and then it goes to the juvenile fish. So there are bigger parts that play, uh, play into the role of fatty acids and food quality. And it's not only you can just look at general zooplankton uh, quality, but also in the species composition. And this is a study from Minna Hiltun. She um, published this last year. And she found that different zooplankton groups have actually different qualities here as DHA EPA ratio. And we, when you look just as an example, she found that amphipods seem to have a higher quality or DHA EPA ratio compared to decapods, which are here, the yellow and the pinkish ones. So it's not only based on, okay, zooplankton is good or whatever, it really depends what they are feeding, which prey species they are feeding on, and if they have enough of that. So what is like, how is the food biomass and the quality actually affected by? And this, uh, one thing you have to think about, one part is that environmental change can actually affect the prey. One is the temperature change. We have global warming. We have the marine heat waves that occur. They can affect um, the prey of juvenile salmon. And especially marine heat waves and temperature are um, uh, are very prominent in the, in the uh, news lately especially the blob from which started, you can see here, it's a marine heat wave in the Gulf of Alaska, the blob. And then you can see from 2013 and then it going into 2014, 
um, that this marine heat wave moved from the Gulf of Alaska into to the coast of British Columbia and then stayed there during the summer of 2015. So based on the data I presented you for 2015 shows or, or already shows it was a very if like temperature affected year. But what happened in 2016? So what happened is that we had a very strong El Nino winter by the end of 2015, which translated into 2016. So the prey from two th the ecosystem in 2016 was affected by this warm summer translated into a very warm winter. And this base basically was a worse effect on the prey species composition and the food quality in 2016. But interestingly, uh, by the end of last year, uh, researchers found that there's actually a new marine heat wave, another blob coming, or they prognose it for this year. So on the left side, you see the um, surface water temperature from 2014 and on the right side for 2019. So it's way warmer and way bigger. So how can, what can we expect by warming, but also another environmental change that can affect ray is also the change of pH, like ocean acidification. So what we can expect is like with, warm, with warmer temperature is a change in the species composition. And this is the shift of species that are migrating from the warmer areas in this figure. It's like Florida is here and then they migrate into the temperature, temperate areas further north to escape the warmer air, water. Like one is the species shift by migration, but also one is that we actually lose a species due to warming, like a diverse and larger species and the pre in the present conditions and a warming of plus six degrees Celsius would lead to less diverse and smaller um, organisms. I did some experiments, uh, mesocosm experiments with the natural species composition in phytoplankton and copepods in the past and tested warming and acidification effects. What we can actually learn from this experience and how can we use this for juvenile salmon. So what I did was first a warming experiment. You see the present temperature in the middle, a cooling scenario and a warming scenario was tested. And this is the abundance of Akasha, Tonsa, um, Copopodite stages. So you see all stages were present in the cooling and present scenarios, but under a warming of four degrees, just like adults and C5 Copopodite stages occurred in a lower abundance. I also looked at the prosome length of Akasha Tonsa stages and saw that with warming, with warmer temperature, we have a decline in the mean prosome length um, in all stages throughout this experiment. I also uh, looked at the, warm, the interaction of warming and acidification. And here again, I start with the mean abundance changes. And on the x-axis, you see the temperature. I, it was two uh, treatments with nine degrees, which is the present scenario, and 15 degrees, which is the warming scenario. And I just concentrate, for example, on copopodate abundance. And you see that um, under the present PCO2 concentrations, we have a decline in mean abundance with warming. But when we look at the difference between at the present temperature, but from present PCO2 to an acidified future scenario, we see that we have a lower abundance in copepodids. And that also the decline with a warming is different between the different CO2 scenarios we were testing. We can also see differences in the prosome length of Akasha tonsa. This is just data for adult Akasha tonsa. And we see again that with warming, we have slightly smaller individuals, but that with acidification, with increase in PCO2, we have that the prosome length is slightly increasing but it's stronger increasing with at colder temperatures. You can see here the difference. 
And also I looked at the fatty acid composition of copepods. And here, for example, I just show the a ratio of polyunsaturated fatty acids to total fatty acids. And I tested here 16 degrees in blue versus 22 degrees in red over the uh, PCO2 gradient. And, and just at the present uh, so PCO2 scenario, we see we have a higher polyunsaturated fatty acid to total fatty acid ratio at warm, colder temperature and less at warmer temperatures. But that this completely shifts um, when we have acidification scenarios here. We have a higher amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, with warming compared to the colder temperature treatments. So when we try to wrap it all together, we have we see this effect in juvenile salmon. They have that food is a, a big driver during in this in the Johnson Strait area. We have low amount of food biomass. We have changes in the species composition. And then we when we are thinking about what do we know from our from experiments, we see that there are actually indirect effects by, the, by environmental change on organisms, that with different temperature or acidification, this affects the abundance. This decreases or increases the individual size of the zooplankton or the copepod, but also the fatty acid composition, so the food quality of each prey item. So when we think about potential effects and what we can do to um, ad adapt fishing plans and treaties uh, of juvenile fish and also of the returning numbers of juvenile salmon, we have to include these parameters, like the species compositions and the individual body size to make better predict predictions and adjustments. But we also, and this is what we actually found, is that we have to think more about the importance of food quality of the fatty co composition. And also we have to think for the future, how to include the fo food quality into ecosystem or food web models or stock assessment and how especially to pro to make projections uh, about return numbers of salmon but also other fish species um, to make better predictions and be more precise about what is going on and how can fish and uh, can fish be affected so by wrapping this up with my conclusions I I'm uh, done with my, my presentation of some results of my past work. Um, a lot of people helped me. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, have more questions for later, um, here are my contact details and I'm happy to chat with every one of you. So thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions now. Thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate that. I know that that's a long time to talk when no one's giving you any feedback. <laughs> you can't see any facial expressions, so thank you so much. Um, for those folks that are online, feel free to type in any questions into the chat box now. Um, and to give you a few minutes to do that, I had a question for you, Jessica, and I know this is a little outside of your um, research project, but can you speak a little bit more about why the salmon choose to go north versus south? They di actually didn't found out like everyone was surprised this is just based on tagging studies that most of them are are going north like it's there's not real reason known for now why they choose to go up there maybe because it's yeah i don't know maybe some seals we are even not sure if it's like a um like like genetic thing like that the parents already chose to go to go up the the north route or not so there's still some uncertainty about why interesting um and i had one other question while we wait just a sec yeah. um so the difference between the two different regions that you were talking about in the limited um transfer between the two of the water. Is there a glacial sill in that area as well? There are smaller sills, but um, just um, just short before we see this vertical front. So the Johnson Strait is like really deep. It goes out to, down to four, three, four hundred meters. And the sill um, in this area where the vertical front is, is like at 200 meters. So um, yeah, but 
otherwise it's like completely deep and like okay. from this part upwards yeah okay we have a question that just came in it says is it correct that there is only one stock of harris river fish that take the southern or western vancouver route oh this is something I actually don't know. <laughs> if it's really just one stock, I'm sorry that I cannot answer that question. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I can look into that. But because most of the time we just look at the um, at the Fraser River, we did some a stock IDing, genetic IDing of the fish uh, I analyzed, and um, they are really there. It's not only the Fraser River. Um, sockeye salmon we I analyzed there's also from other areas but um, yeah sorry I, I for the southern part I cannot say that all right we have um, several people that are saying nice presentation by the way um, and then we have another question here have you considered the DHA EPA ratio is not always good um, it is a function of the lipid class and is increased, um, can also indicate starvation. Yes, um, this is something we uh, were discussing that especially when you have the, um, the, uh, the mobilization of energy from fatty acids to ATP, um, EPA, the DHA EPA ratio can, um, can change with starvation because uh, EPA is mobilized easier than DHA based on the chemical um, um, D by using the dehydrogenase, D dehydrogenase of the fatty acids to make ATP. And this is way faster and more efficient using EPA. So when the EPA is used as um, an energy source, the DHA concentrations stays the same and it goes up. But uh, we considered it with also fatty acids concentrations in the, in the zooplankton, that this is a good indication. But it's true, DHA EPA ratio, just looking at one fatty acid is not always giving the whole picture. Um, so we had another question here about, um, is there any information on the rates of ju juvenile salmon movements through the straits in good and bad years? Not between years. We have tagging data from both years and um, we try to figure out if um, the salmon is kind of hanging out. So what we did, we collected salmon during the strait. They got the tags and they were released in the northern strait of Georgia again and to to see where they are swimming and how fast they are swimming. What we know is that the juvenile salmon is really browsing really fast to the Johnson Strait area. And um, they spend not so much time there, but that they sometimes, um, maybe I, when I go back to the figure where they move, I can show it maybe a bit better, um, is, when we look here, so they browse really fast through the Johnston Strait, either the north or the south coast, but along the north or the, the south co coast. But sometimes in the Discovery Islands, they hang out in some areas, but also they decide, okay, I just go this northern part, then decide, oh no, I go back and then take the other route. So sometimes it's also with the, uh, with fatty acids, um, it's a little bit tricky. They are not responding as fast air as the RNA-DNA ratio. So the RNA-DNA ratio responds within three to five days. So what they ex um, experienced before, but the fatty acids is are changing on a lower rate, like usually like two to three weeks. It, so everything what we see in our data is a little bit time. There's a time like when you compare fatty acids with the RNA DNA data. Yeah. Um, so Jessica Miller asks if there are any trends in the um, sockeye abundance within the three regions. And do you think the mortality is happening there? Or do you think it has to do with the condition of the fish once they get into the ocean that's influencing their uh, future survival? So we cannot, um, what we see is we have 
differences in the peaks because we can just do this uh, so we just do the surface spotting the uh, the estimates of the abundance is like just it's really subjective because what we can just see when we arrive in this area and we are not spotting like we changed the look sampling locations over the different years but um, it seems that in the discovery islands based in some regions they are more fish, but we are not sure if they are just hanging out longer there or not. And also because the sampling, um, the spatial sampling is not in the same frequency when we have to go further up north in the Queen Charlotte Strait compared to, because we, um, the station we start our survey is Quadra Island, this located here. So it's, um, stations around Quadra Island are way more often sampled than the ones up here. So um, yeah, we cannot really say this based on the method, but we see differences between years, but not really differences between the different regions, but yeah, can be a methodological reason, yeah. All right, I don't see any more questions coming in, Jessica. Um, so I want to thank you once again for joining us and being a part of our uh, virtual experience. Yeah, um, and for those that are online, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you um, join us at Science on Tap and for next week's seminar. Um, if you have additional questions for Jessica, she put up her, maybe you can throw that up one more time for us, Jessica, yes, the so contact course. information. Yeah. Um, and you can reach out to her directly. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. I please contact me, bother me with questions, then that would be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. All right, Jessica, thank you so much. Take a drink of water and relax yeah. and yeah. thank you. Yeah. Have a great day. All right. You <laughs> Thanks too. for Bye having me. Bye.